Hi everyone, I'm Nancy at the Behavior Department at the Winnipeg Humane Society, and today we're going to go through the introduction to Reactive Rover Class PowerPoint. So, let's get started. Does this look familiar to anyone? Leash reactivity is a very common issue with our dogs, um, so take heart, you're not alone, and we can help with this class. The bad news, uh, we can't typically cure a dog of their, all their reactivity, but we can use classes like this to help manage it effectively. So we're going to start with why are dogs reactive on leash in the first place? Well, there could be different possibilities and any or all of these may um, apply to your dog. So they could be just overexcited and they're hyper motivated to greet, but the leash is stopping them so they get frustrated. Uh, they may have had bad experiences on leash in the past with other dogs approaching them, which makes them fearful of other dogs coming forward. Uh, they may have been under socialized as puppies and just don't have any experience on leash and, and are unsure about the situation. They could be just genetically naturally fearful, that can happen. Uh, different dogs are going to be have different levels of uh, reactivity to new things, and especially on leash. So. Um, Another thing that can make your dog's reactivity worse is past use of aversive training techniques. So if your dog was punished um, harshly for lunging on leash before, they can start seeing that uh, the sight of another dog means something painful is about to happen and can actually like seeing other dogs on leash less and can increase their reactivity. So any of these things may apply to your dogs. Um, what are our goals and objectives of the Reactive Rover class? Well, we want to understand what our dog's triggers are. We want to learn to read our dog's body language. Super important because that's how dogs communicate with us, how they're feeling and uh, that sort of thing. So we want to get uh, really good at reading our dog's body language. We're going to work on desensitize, desensitizing our dogs to their triggers and to increase the tolerance of them. In a, um, we want to decrease the stress of the dog and the handler. It can be very stressful owning a reactive dog, um, you know, and even a little embarrassing and you're on leash and having, or your dog's on leash having a nice walk around the neighborhood and they have a big reactive episode. And sometimes other people aren't very understanding or very kind and that can be very stressful. Uh, I had my own reactive dog. Uh, she lived till she was 13. And, you know, so I've been on the roller coaster of the reactive dog and uh, I know how you're feeling so you're not alone. So we need to set reasonable goals for our dog. Uh, not every dog is going to go from being super reactive on leash to be able to walk through the local farmers market where there's tons of people and maybe other dogs on leash but we can think of a reasonable goal for our dog and work with them where they are. So uh, body language. Um, all reactive dogs are stressed dogs, whether it's because of overexcitement or because they're anxious um, or they're fearful. So we want to be able to read our dogs for signs of stress. Um, the sooner the, the better um, <clears throat> when they're having a, um, when they're out on leash. So all these different, th this list of all these different signs are all possible signs your dog may give that they're feeling a little bit stressed. Not all dogs are gonna show all signs in all situations. Um, this is just to give you an idea that there are a lot of them. Um, and some of them can depend on um, things like your dog's own body shape and, and, um, and that sort of thing. Like a lowered tail position is one of the signs of a stressed dog. Well, that can look very different in say like a greyhound that naturally has a dog, uh, naturally has a tail that stays tucked close to their body versus a husky that normally has an upright tail. So um, so we have to learn how to read our own individual dogs. So we're going to start with a little practice about reading dog body behavior. We, we see these two dogs here. They're both panting, but they have very different facial expressions. Um, I think most people might have an idea what's going on, but we can break it down by body part. So we have the shepherd mix on the left. Eyes are big and round. Facial muscles are tense. You can see all kinds of wrinkles on the forehead and behind the mouth. Uh, ears are pinned back, and even his tongue is tense. That shape right there is what we call a spatulate tongue or spoon tongue, and that's the shape it takes when a dog is super tense. And a lot of um, a lot of times it uh, goes along with really shallow, rapid panting. So all signs of stress in dogs. Whereas now we look at the golden retriever on the right, we got squinty little eyes. Facial muscles are just super soft. Ears are hanging. Even his tongue is just kind of laying there on his teeth. That's a sign of a 
those are all signs of a less stressed dog. So, so uh, there's some of these signs that dogs show when they show stress, they're kind of in a, a category that we would call distance increasing signals. Now these are uh, behaviors dogs throw out, body language, to try to gain social distance from other dogs and people. Uh, learning how to read these signals can keep everybody safe and prevent dog bites. You'll hear a lot from people, they'll say the dog bites came out of nowhere and had no, they had no idea. A lot of times it's not because the dog wasn't giving signals, it's just that it's hard for sometimes for people to read them. So the more we practice reading them, the better we'll get at it. And, uh, but I'm sure no one needs practice to read the, the signals of the dog on the upper, upper left. He's flashing some teeth, he's leaning forward. His, you can see his muscles. So his muscles are all tense and he's on his toes and he's saying, go away, right? I'm sure we would all listen to that. Well, what about the dog on the bottom right though? Also throwing off a lot of, uh, a lot of shy signals that are distance increasing signals. Um, very often these are the kind of dogs that do end up biting because no one listens to them and they think they're giving off big signals but sometimes humans don't read them very well. So he's got his lowered head, his ears are pinned back, you can see the white of his eye, we call that whale eye. Um, those are all signs of discomfort. So we would also be just as cautious with the dog um, below as we might be with the dog on top. So here's a few other pictures of some dog body language, just to things we can point out. We have the speckled dog on the upper left, standing up very tall, very straight, very direct. That is confrontational in dog language, so that is not, hey, come on over, let's play, uh, kind of body language. Uh, then we have the, the black dog and the brown dog on the, on the top right. The black dog is staring directly at the brown dog's head, eyes round, ears pinned back. But you notice what the brown dog's doing? We call those uh, one of the calming signals. And calming signals are a group of behaviors that dogs give to other dogs in a communication of, I'm not trying to cause problems so you can relax, you can calm down. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, black dog's uncomfortable, brown dog goes, oop, not trying to cause a problem. So hopefully the brown dog, the black dog will take that and go, oh, okay, so we don't need to cause, have any problems. That's probably the sort of thing that happened in the pictures in the bottom. Say pictures uh, don't tell the whole story, but we have the golden retriever who is looking off to the right and the, the uh, German Shepherd who is sniffing at the ground, they're both actively avoiding each other. Those are both uh, calming signals too, or displacement behaviors. And uh, so they're both going, okay, well, we don't want any problems. So that's awesome uh, dog social skills. And sometimes people don't read those either because they think, oh no, go be friends, go be friends, when both the dogs are going, nope, thank you, I don't want to go meet him. So, um, so yeah, so the dogs have these conversations all the time. And if you notice uh, with these ones, dogs, they're all, nobody is being walked on leash. Uh, the German Shepherd has a long line on him, but he's really loose. Um, leashes really complicate dogs communication because it, uh, they can make them not be able to express their natural behaviors and they give off their natural communications. Here's an example here where we have two dogs in two separate meetings with very different body languages. And if you notice the dog on the left, or the, the meeting on the left, both their leashes are tense, and on the right, they're loose. So what's going on here? Well, that tight leash exaggerates the dog's body language and complicates the meeting. The spotted brown dog might be just excited to meet, so he's pulling forward. Well, what it does is it makes him stand forward, up on his toes, his head is straight forward. He looks kind of like the speckled dog from the earlier slide which is a confrontational body language that he may not be feeling, but the leash is putting him into saying that to the other dog. If you notice the white dog is leaning away with one paw up in the air, we call that unsure paw, because um, he's really not too sure about this guy who's all forward in his face. So, but if you notice the, the uh, greeting on the right, leashes are loose, their body language is much more relaxed. Um, both the dogs are slightly leaning away from each other. They may not be best friends, but um, they're having a much more relaxed meeting and it will probably go much better. So um, all these different body languages dogs throw off um, that may indicate they're stressed work on a continuum. So while not all dogs will show all these behaviors, if they do show these behaviors, it'll generally be from um, the blue step on the bottom up to the red step. So dogs start with the blue step called displacement behaviors and that's when they do something 
they don't want to uh, confront the other dog, so they'll do something else instead, completely different, like sniff the ground, like the German Shepherd in the picture, um, and uh, or sniff the ground, and uh, yeah, like the German Shepherd. And one good analogy I saw for human beings is if you're walking down a hallway and there's somebody coming towards you you don't want to talk to, people whip out their phones and start reading on their phones. That's a displacement behavior. They don't want to deal with that, so they'll just do this instead. So dogs will do that and then if uh, they see something they're not too sure about and they don't want to deal with and they'll do that if it's still an issue for them, say if it isn't, let's pretend it's another dog. So that dog is still there, they might start throwing calming signals where if that dog's looking at them, they might turn away, lick their lips, yawn. There's all these signs they give that are calming signals to tell the other dog to calm down. If the other dog doesn't, their stress may increase and um, a lot of this is things that the dog can't control. Like if their hackles come up at this point, dogs aren't in control of their hackles. They aren't thinking, hey, I'll stick my hackles up and tell that guy I'm feeling stressed. It just happens. So, um, you know, and, and they'll, their pupils dilate and that sort of thing. Um, and if it, but if it continues, the stress continues, we're under the orange step, they stop trying to do behaviors. Um, it didn't work. They tried the calming signals. The other dog isn't calming down, isn't going away. So that's when they will close their mouth. They will freeze and stop doing any behaviors. And then in that second, if it still becomes bad, then they're onto the red step. That's when they're showing their teeth, they're growling, preparing to defend themselves, and they're barking and lunging. Um, and that's usually when people recognize the reactivity, when the reactivity started way down the, down the ladder. So um, we want to start recognizing them when they're on the blue and the green steps so they never get to the red step. And that's one of the goals of Reactive Rover class. So recognizing your dog's triggers. What makes your dog react? Every dog's going to be different. They could have multiple triggers. And we're going to talk about, um, you know, how and when they might, and sometimes and not other times. Here are some common triggers. Other dogs on leash. Wheels like bikes, could be skateboards, could be cars. Um, you know, just anything that zips by really fast. Could be small children, they run kind of erratically and they move around erratically and they have high squeaky voices. That can get some dogs really excited. And then of course we have nature's dog toy, the squirrel. Uh, and other critters can be, uh, can be a big trigger for some dogs. So we gotta think about our individual dogs and, and um, what they, uh, what they react to. So another factor that goes into reactivity is these three ideas of intensity, distance, and duration. So intensity, how intense is that trigger? If a dog is walking away from them, is that okay? But if that dog turns around and faces them with the pointy end, is that just a little too much for them to deal with? You know, or is a bike being walked by a person going by them is fine, but if a bike zips by at a high rate of speed, that is much more exciting and that can, can um, might be a factor too. So how far away from the dog is the trigger? Usually if a, a trigger is farther away, it can be easier for a dog to deal with than if it's up close and personal to them. Um, so uh, duration would be the other along is how long do they have to deal with it? Are they okay walking down a sidewalk and having a dog cross the street across in front of them and so they only see them for a few seconds but if a dog is walking parallel to them say on the other side of the street and they're in view of each other for a long time is that just too much so those all can all be factors and so can this stress stacking or trigger stacking so just like us if we're having a stressful day it makes us less able to deal with things that happen uh, dogs are the exact same way so if you take your dog out for a walk, and like our little little chart here has, maybe the yellow box is a, a they see another dog who's looking at them and they get kind of excited, but they're, they move on on their walk. And then maybe the blue square is a, a cat runs across the road and they're very excited by the cat, but you know, they're still listening to you and they're paying attention. Um, but then the green one, they're, they're coming home and then your neighbor's dog barks at the fence and your dog explodes. And you're thinking, what the heck? You know, um, they, they see each other all the time and, and it, he doesn't react. But it was just because of, that was just too many stresses in too short a period of time. And they can make them, uh, can make them react to things they might not in other situations. So, so here we're gonna talk about how, uh, another little chart on what happens internally inside our dogs when they're um, 
encounter a trigger and what their behavior looks like. So when they're under threshold, like we say, under the point where they're going to react, um, they're usually pretty loose. They're hanging out. They're doing their thing. They're going for a walk. They'll look at you if you talk to them. They'll take a treat from you. It's all fine. Um, but then maybe that trigger that they saw in the distance that was like, yeah, no big deal. Now it's a little bit closer and they stop and they look and their ears come up. But they can still listen to you. They'll still go, oh, yeah, right, okay, and uh, move away and they'll still take treats and that sort of thing. That, those states are what we call under threshold. And that's in reactive rubber class where we keep them under threshold so they can learn and do all these fun things with us. Um, once a dog gets over threshold, that's they get into the orange part of the chart here, that's when they start to freeze, their hackles come up, they're pulling, they may growl, they won't take food anymore, they're not looking, you're, you're, asking, you're asking for attention and they are just not listening to you, it's like you're not even there. And then they move into the barking, the growling, the snapping and the lunging. Um, so those are the states we want to keep them out of, uh, especially in reactive rumor class, but even when you are you know, going for walks. Um, you want to try and keep them under threshold as much as possible. It's not always a perfect world, especially when you live in a city and you may see uh, triggers all over the place, but we can think about how we can manage our dog's reactivity by um, keeping the triggers not too intense for not too long and not too close a distance, just like the other, uh, the other slide said. So how are, how are we doing that? How are we going to help our reactive dogs? And this is just a gratuitous picture of a cute dog who was up for adoption here a while ago. <clears throat> uh, so what are we gonna work on? Our toolbox in the class. So we're gonna talk about proper equipment we can use. We're gonna work on our handling and mechanical skills of our dog. And we're gonna work on communication with our dog, which can help improve our trust and understanding and uh, make for a better relationship with our dog. We're gonna do some focus and relaxation exercises in the controlled setting. Um, in our reactive rover class, your dog will not be confronted with the uh, with being able to see other reactive dogs. We give them their own little space um, where they can't see. So in a controlled setting, we get them focusing and relaxing. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about management practices, about how to best deal with your dogs in the, out in public and at home. And we'll do some positive reinforcement training, um, which includes DRI, which is differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. So basically, if your dog is playing these games with us, they're not reacting to another dog. So they can't do two things at once. So we'll reinforce them positively for doing good stuff and then they're not doing the other stuff. So while we're doing this, we gotta remember every walk's a training walk. Every time your dog gets over threshold, it's, uh, it's actually they've taught themselves to get over threshold. So we wanna keep them under threshold and keep everything. It's always, uh, we're always training with our dogs while we're working on this stuff. So we're going to do a bit of learning theory here. We'll talk a little bit about getting a little bit of the how and why we train the way we do. Um, so the two main um, factors into dog training, we use classical conditioning and operating conditioning. So let's talk a little bit about that stuff. So classical conditioning is things that our bodies learn um, without us thinking about them. The classic example is Pavlov's dogs, where Ivan Pavlov realized that the dogs he had in his lab could anticipate being fed. So he realized, uh, he made a new experiment and would ring a bell, feed the dogs, ring a bell, feed the dogs, read a bell, don't feed the dogs. He measured and they salivated the exact same without food in front of them as they did with food in front of them because their bodies had learned the bell sound meant the food was coming. So. Um, dogs didn't think about it. They can't make themselves salivate. It's their bodies had actually learned it, been conditioned to it. And so in the same similar way, our reactive dogs um, see a trigger and can get emotional, start climbing that stress ladder. It's not because they're doing it, it's their bodies doing it. So we can also use classical conditioning to go the other way and get them to think seeing their trigger means good things are going to happen. So um, we can get them to um, change their emotional response to things. So operant conditioning is what people typically think of as dog training. And uh, so we have either, we have training behaviors. So we either want behaviors to increase or behaviors to decrease. So we can do that by adding something to the situation or we can remove something from the situation. So between those, we come up with four different ways that we can uh, try to get our dogs to do the behaviors that we want them to do. Um, we can do things to reinforce behaviors which means increase them, or we can do things to punish their behaviors or decrease them. 
That's a slightly different use of the word punishment than people are used to. Um, we're mostly going to do positive reinforcement, which means if a dog does a when a dog does a good behavior, we reward that good behavior with something they find good, whatever that might be. Classic example: your dog sits, you give them a cookie, it increases the chance they're going to sit when we ask them to because they know the good things follow. Um, we'll also use a little. Uh, we have can use sometimes a little bit of negative reinforcement um, and a little bit of negative punishment. Negative punishment: a good example: dog jumps up because they want our attention. We take away what they want. Negative means remove. So we're gonna remove our attention to punish their behavior for jumping up. And hopefully the idea being that the dog stops jumping up so much. Um, we actually do that quite effectively here in the shelter a lot. Um, so it can be very effective. The one quadrant we don't use is positive punishment, which would be if a dog does not want a behavior and we, we add something to it. So we add something aversive, something a dog doesn't like to make them stop the behavior. Um, if your dog's jumping up, he's a jumping up example, the dog jumps up on you and we're told knee them in the chest so it hurts and then they won't jump up on you anymore. Problem is with positive punishment, it can often have uh, unintended side effects or can, when it's not effective, it actually is a reinforcer so it causes all kinds of um, things we don't want to happen. Like an earlier example is if your dog is reacting on leash and someone punishes them for it, it can actually make them see the dog that they were looking at cause the punishment and make them dislike other dogs even more to actually increase the reactivity. So we're not gonna use that. We're gonna use mostly positive reinforcement. When we see good behaviors out of our dog, we're gonna reward them for that, whatever that reward means. In class, we start with food. Um, out in the real world, it can be different things. It could be play with you. It can be a toy. It can be a simple pet. It can be lots of different things. Um, reinforcers can be all kinds of things. It depends on what your dog likes individually. So. Okay, so uh, here's some equipment we can use while we're training our dog. We have uh, on the yellow lab, a front uh, chest clip harness. We highly re recommend those for dogs who pull a lot on leash. They can be a way to manage their behavior while you're teaching them to walk nicely on leash. They won't make your dog walk nicely, but they can be a tool to manage them while you're training them to walk nicely on leash. Um, they can also help control, especially if you have a large powerful dog, they can be very helpful. Um, but also with the small dogs, it's easy to let smaller dogs get away with pulling because it's not as big a deal for us. But for them, it is. Like we talked about the leash. Leash is frustrating dogs and in increasing their, um, in interfering with their, their natural body language. So we don't want small dogs to pull on leash either. Um, so we've also got the bottom right. We have a dog wearing a gentle leader, which is one of the different kinds of head halters you can use. They can be very effective. Dogs can find them um, unpleasant and don't like them, so you really should desensitize your dog to them before you use them. So if anybody's interested in that, we can certainly help them out. Um, so the lady above is wearing a hands-free leash around her waist. So you have a belt and the leash comes off it. They can be excellent while you're training your dog because it's one less thing to hang on to. And plus, if your dog does pull, um, maybe even you know, kind of surprises you. Uh, the leash is around your center of gravity, so it can help you stay steadier on your feet. And um, and then on the bottom left, we have a treat pouch, which I highly recommend, and it just clips onto your waistband, or you can get ones with belts, where your treats are right there, they're easy to grab, you don't have to fumble through a pocket, pull up a Ziploc to get a treat out. The more quickly we reward our dog while we're training them, the, um, the quicker they will understand what we're trying to communicate. So I highly recommend a tree pouch. Uh, the added benefit if you don't have squishy dog treats in your in your clothes. Um, so they're all good. And the other piece of equipment in there is the little black and yellow clicker. A clicker is a way to communicate with our dog in a very uh, precise and effective manner. They can also be something um, if normally we ask our dog to sit and we say good boy and give him a treat, the click can replace the good boy and be more specific. Um, it's another piece of equipment. Some people really like using them and if you are, we can, would like to, we can definitely work with that too. So things we ask people to bring to class uh, to use is a mat or a rug and you can use like say a bath mat or a yoga mat or just something um, big enough for the dog to, to lay down on because this is going to be the place your dog learns to relax in class. It's going to be their happy place. Only good things ever happen when they're on their mat and uh, it can be a very valuable skill for a dog to have to go to their, go to their happy place. Um, we're going to ask you bring lots of tiny, tiny high value food rewards. 
Uh, dogs don't care if a treat is huge or tiny, so we'll give them lots of little tiny ones. And this is the time to bring high, high value, um, real meat, cheese, something your dog really loves. My dog would be anything for turkey. So that was what we used for training and usually only for training. And she knew that that meant it was uh, pretty special. So that's when we want to bring something uh, really good that our dog will for sure take no matter how excited they are. And then we want to bring a bowl for water because treats can make you thirsty. So, so how, and then we're going to be, uh, so these are the kind of games we're going to play in reactive rover class. We, um, in, in teaching these, it, can, it helps the dogs uh, relax, helps them focus on us, and can help them be less reactive. So we play games like find it and touch and look at that. And we open bar, close bar is an exercise where to help dogs start feeling good about when they see their trigger. You know, seeing a dog means great things rain on me. Um, down on me like cheese and beef and that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to talk about different ways you can mentally stimulate your dog to reduce their stress. A lot of reactive dogs are anxious dogs or high and, and or high energy dogs. So we want to reduce their stress in general and mentally stimulate them can really help with that. And then we can also work on um, mechanical skills like U-turns to help us get out of get out of trouble when uh, if there's uh, no other options. So, so these are all the great things that we'll work on in reactive rover class. And here, and uh, finally, we have a picture of an actual reactive rover class. This is one of the last classes. And our German Shepherd in the middle was very reactive on leash. Uh, the little black dog is non-reactive. And so she was our sample dog. And, but if you notice the German Shepherd is paying attention to her owner, the leash is loose, the dog is relaxed and focused. And you can see off to the right, the other family is behind the barrier with their dog. So they can watch and see what's going on, but their dog doesn't see um, see one of her triggers and get super excited. So that's how we run our classes. And as you can see from how our German Shepherd is behaving, they can be very effective. And so there is hope for your reactive dog. And, and so we'll, uh, yeah, just uh, keep positive. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's the end of our introduction. And so we'll see you at our next, uh, we'll see you at our next video.